Okay, um, well done for getting here, that's really good. Uh, this is the middle of our theory block. So last week was kind of like theory one, this is theory two, and then next week is the end of the... I would say this is the bulk of the theory. So, um, I called this one, um, and never the twain shall meet. I actually called it, and ne'er the twain shall meet, which I believe is a misquotation, but it's a quotation from a film in which there's a misquotation. That's fine. And never the tw east is east and west is west, and never the twain shall meet. Um, so, this week, this is what it says in the module handbook, so you don't need to write this down. Um, we're going to pose the question of what it even means to say east meets west, or one culture crosses and meets another one in some way. So the examples are, uh, this week, we're looking at East Asia again. Um, we're going to have some, some examples at the end that are, are more to do with India, um, perhaps. So the, the first example is um, Martin Heidegger. So Heidegger, did anyone manage to have a Have you looked at it yet, or are you saving that pleasure for tonight? Enjoy it tonight, yeah. So um, Heidegger first, interview style, conversation style. Then an article by Stella Sandford that some of you struggled to locate, so I sent you the link, which is a, it's a kind of philosophy theory article. And then the Ray Chow um, chapter, which is long, but it has sort of three-ish to four-ish sections. The most important one for you is the first section on stereotypes. Um, so I'm going to talk you through these texts today. I think I'll chop this up into three blocks, probably. I'll probably do Heidegger, then have a break, because we might all need to have a break. And then Stella Sanford, and then Ray Chow. That's probably, this is the structure. So Heidegger, Stella Sanford, um, something on a, a selection on I, on some general stuff on Eastern versus Western philosophy. Now the Stella Sandford text goes into some detail, and you can go as far down these rabbit holes as you want to go. I think that probably this week, at the best, the most likely result is that you'll go, that's a complicated jumble of ideas. I might want to look into the, this jumble or that jumble. Some of you might have already been rummaging around in questions of philosophy, East and West philosophy, in which case it'll probably stick this time. But for you, some of you, it might be completely new and, and you might just go, hmm, interesting concepts that I need to, to look into closely. So then Ray Chow's reading of stereotypes. Now, I'm sure you all feel like you've done stereotypes to death. But, and that's fine, but Ray Chow's argument is, is really interesting because unlike most of um, theories and approaches to stereotypes, her argument is that you're probably not going to get rid of them, so you can't view them as some kind of aberration. Maybe they're a universal law. Maybe there's not only good, there's not only bad ones, but also good ones. So we need to kind of tackle them head on. And then some examples. So we've got Ray Chow's examples from her chapter on comic strips and, uh, and comedy um, type texts, and then some of my own examples from British television. So, the first text I want you to look at is Martin Heidegger, A Dialogue and Language Between Japanese and an Inquirer. This is a weird and cringeworthy text, and it's doubly cringeworthy because it's not actually a conversation between Martin Heidegger and a Japanese visitor. It's Heidegger's kind of at best, his memory of a conversation, but probably just his imagining of a conversation, like an ideal conversation. And it's cringy. The only saving quality of it is that this is a genre of writing that um, is dominant in the tradition of ancient philosophy that Heidegger most admired. So if you read any Plato, it's always just Socrates having an argument with someone and, and beating them in his argument, in, the, in their argument. So, Heidegger's done the same thing. It's like he's done a bit of creative writing where he imagines a Japanese philosophy student comes to visit him and asks him about his um, relationship with, with Eastern philosophy and Western philosophy. But it's, it's a cringy read. And it's made doubly cringy because, so Heidegger, 
was um, a, a hugely influential philosopher of the first half of the 20th century, and he influenced really every thinker that you would call post-structuralist, so that all of your, like Derrida, Foucault, um, loads of German names, lots of French names, but, and a lot of these are Jewish intellectuals. Derrida, as a Jewish intellectual, loved Heidegger. Heidegger was a member of the Nazi party. Because, I mean, he kind of had to be. To have a, any kind of public office in Germany in the 1930s, you had to join. So anyone who was a professor or a lecturer or anything public like that, they joined the Nazi party, they were, they were a member of it. The problem with Heidegger is that he never said anything negative about them, he never announced it after the war, he just, just didn't talk about it. So people go, hmm, Heidegger, Nazi. And people like Derrida, who's like Jacques Derrida, very clever person, very Jewish, very kind of Jewish Algerian, never judged Heidegger badly because his philosophy was so interesting to him. So, this is the thing about Heidegger. Some of his ideas and his ways of approaching um, philosophical questions were really radical and, and kind of inspiring to people, um, even though he was kind of a, a Nazi. And this is also a, a structure that um, will come back. So, if you do try to read the Ray Chow article, um, she does a similar kind of work on Derrida, in that Derrida has, um, Jacques Derrida has a really problematic philosophical relationship with, with the concept of China. And she, her argument is like, yeah, he doesn't ever write about China or Asia or anything that's not really mainstream European philosophy. Derrida always focused on the really elitist stuff, really um, well-established Western philosophical traditions. So does that mean Derrida is Eurocentric or something like that? And Chow's argument is no. Derrida is not Eurocentric even though he never looked at China, always used it as a kind of, this is a line I cannot cross. And then he turned and looked at classic European philosophy. Ray Chow says no, actually Derrida's approach is not Eurocentric, it's, it's not anti-Chinese, it's actually incredibly enabling for thinking about what Europe means and the critique of Eurocentrism. So that's a lot of blurbs that, that you know do with that as you will. What's interesting in Heidegger's argument? So Heidegger's argument is in my position is this. I agree with Stella Sandford. It's really interesting, deeply problematic, and kind of um, possibly a bit racist in the end. And that's because of the structure of his thought. And Heidegger, the structure of Heidegger's thought is probably what we might call um, Orientalist in terms of the categories that we've been developing uh, over the last couple of weeks. Because he does propose a line between East and West, between what he calls Europe or America, sometimes things like Euro-America, and he calls it the East Asian world. Uh, by which he's talking about uh, Japan specifically in this instance, but he means everything non-European. Um, we always draw some kind of distinguishing line. We kind of go, here's the line, this is me or this is us and that is them. And that's where difference is and here is where we know what we're dealing with. We all do that. You kind of have to do it in order to, to have concepts and uh, concepts like here and there and now and then and all the rest of it. Um, but so Heidegger definitely does this, but even though he's made possibly a category mistake, possibly a little bit racist in the end, possibly very, um, he thinks some interesting problems using this. So the concept that he goes after first is the idea of translation and what it means to take a concept from another language, or what Heidegger calls a life world, and plant it into a, a, a different linguistic or cultural context, what happens then? So, when I've written J, that's the Japanese 
fictional guest or, or hypothetical guest, and I is the inquirer, which means Heidegger. So these are the two people speaking. So Heidegger um, kind of refers to um, a philosophical expert from Japan as Count Kuki. So the Japanese guy says, in the book, he, Count Kuki, attempts to consider the nature of Japanese art with the help of European aesthetics. So European aesthetic theory. And then Heidegger says, but in such an attempt, may we turn to aesthetics? Why not? The name aesthetics and what it names grow out of European thinking, out of philosophy. Consequently, aesthetic consideration must ultimately remain alien to East Asian thinking. So, the very concept of aesthetics, Heidegger says, is a European concept. How can you apply that to a non-European world, conceptual universe? Um, I mean, we all kind of probably got our own little examples of different languages that chop up concepts and, and terms differently. You know, th it's really interesting to like look and you know, you know, in Chinese, there's no distinction between blue and green, or you know, the, the, all these lots of different examples like that. The French language had a terrible concept, had a terrible problem with feminism, because they didn't have very many distinctions between feminine, femininity, feminist. They they kind of conflated concepts that other that other languages would expand into different concepts. Um, so aesthetics, the very concept of aesthetics, Heidegger saying, is part of European conceptual systems, and that it's wrong to apply them to non-European life worlds, because it's different entirely. So, so they're de dealing with the question of whether it's necessary and rightful for East Asians to chase after the European conceptual systems. Hmm. In the face, so this is um, the Japanese guest, in the face of modern technicalization and industrialization of every continent, there would seem to be no escape any longer. You, see, you speak cautiously, you say it would seem. Indeed, for the possibility still always remains that, seen from the point of view of our East Asian existence, the technical world which sweeps us along must confine itself to surface matters and that, that for this reason alone a true encounter with European existence is still not taking place in spite of all assimilations and intermixtures. Perhaps we will let ourselves be led astray by the wealth of concepts which the spirit of the European languages has in store and will look down upon what claims our existence as on something that is vague and amorphous. So, this, I think, is Heidegger's ultimate contention. Well, we, there's a lot of it going on here, and you'll see more of it in a minute. There's a technicalization and industrialization of the earth, says Heidegger. And it's sweeping the earth, and you can't avoid it no matter where you are. You're going to be, in, you're going to be technicalized, you're going to be industrialized. So this, this we're looking at 1930s, 1940s, 1950s at the latest. Um, when this is, this is taking place, Heidegger wrote this in the 50s, translated into English in the 70s. Um, a true encounter is not taking place. European concepts are swamping everything. Europe so European technology, European industry, you know, the, uh, the narrative is the Industrial Revolution started in Europe, started in Britain, started in Europe, and then the, the steamboats chuffed around the world, chuff, 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 and they, then they start to mine and exploit and all the rest of it. And it's a European domination of the world. So, there's that. There's the Europeanization of the world. This is Heidegger's hypothesis. <clears throat> and also, the idea that you can't simply translate certain concepts from one universe into another universe. There's a, converse, there's a section in this where the Japanese guest says, yeah, but I mean, you know, like Count Kuki could speak perfect. Um, 
it might even be in this section here, I can't remember which bits I've put in, but let's have a look. So the danger of our dialogues was hidden in language itself, not in what we discussed, but in the way in which we tried to do so. Here we are, yes. But Count Cookie had uncommonly good command of German and of French and English, did he not? Of course, he could say in European languages whatever was under discussion, but we were discussing Iki. And here it was I to whom the spirit of the Japanese language remained closed, as it does to this day. The languages of the dialogue shifted everything into European, yet the dialogue tried to say the essential nature of East Asian art and poetry. Ah, now I'm beginning to understand better where you smell the danger. The language of the dialogue constantly destroyed the possibility of saying what the dialogue was about. So, Count Kuki is trying to tell Heidegger about Iki, Japanese term, and Heidegger is trying to get his head round it. And Iki, if you look on Wikipedia now, or you look on Google, Iki, no problem. Loads of explanations, loads of examples, as if it's not a problem, and we can go, okay, I get, I get Iki, I get it, it's a kind of Japanese etiquette, style, chic, kind of naturalness that's also incredibly cultured. It's like, it's like that. If you start to say Japanese-ness, I guess you would also be invoking the concept of, of, of Iki. It's the kind of, the, the je ne sais quoi that would be, that, that arrow would say, Iki, it's called Iki. That's what it is. It's that kind of cultural now sort of style. These are some of the images that pop up when you, when you search for Iki on Google. Heidegger's not, I don't think he's getting at that. I'm sure that his fictional or possibly at some point real Japanese guest had said, well, Iki's kind of like this. It's kind of style, it's kind of, but specifically Japanese and it's quintessentially about behaviour and comportment and, and class and all the rest of it. And Heidegger presumably doesn't mean that he doesn't understand it on that level, but he doesn't understand it in an authentic and expansive and deep level because it's a, like a local cultural concept. So, there might be something really valuable here, like there is cultural difference, like we all know it, we've all come here from different cultural contexts, and also this in itself is a cultural context. It's, you find it incredibly difficult and frustrating to explain to your family like what it's like at Cardiff University because they just and you can use words. It's a university. There are students. There are lecturers. We have lectures. We have seminars. We we write essays. That, and then go yeah yeah I get that I understand that but they'll not get it in an essential sense like that's unique and specific to you. So Heidegger is kind of theorizing the way in which very different cultural and social contexts with different histories, different linguistic structures, different concepts, um, are untranslatable to each other, or very, very awkward and crudely translatable to each other. And there's probably something in that, because I mean, it, that's, that's what cultural difference is. And I mean, we can now, like, when well, I say we, got Chinese students in here, got students from, from other, other countries as well, all over the place. We can zoom around the world and go to art galleries and look at art, right? But the concept of art is not a very old one, like that there is a thing called art and that you hang it on walls and you look at it and go, oh, I wonder what the artist meant. That's a new Western, it is a Western concept, it just is, it's a Western Institutional concept, concepts like literature, yeah, capital L, literature, right? New concept, it's a new thing, and it's a European one, and it's one that's enshrined in certain law, certain, certain legal concepts. So, famous example, um, Salman Rushdie wrote a book called The Satanic Verses in uh, about the late 1980s or early 90s, and it's a work of art, it's a, it's a work of literature, but in this, something blasphemous happens. So there's some kind of dream of the prophet, and there's something sexual, I haven't read it. Um, but in the West, you can kind of go, that's art. You can say what you like about anyone. You can say what you like about the queen, the prime minister, you can say about God, about G, about Buddha, about anyone. 
because it's called literature and legal battles have been won. The battle that defined literature in this country was the Lady Chatterley's Lover book trial. Lady Chatterley's Lover was accused of being pornography and they had a court case in which people like Raymond Williams were, were expert witnesses who said, no, it's art, it's literature, it's literature. It's not pornography because it has these values and these things going on. So, literature, art, philosophy, these are European concepts. Iki is a Japanese concept. We can get them, we kind of go, yeah, I kind of get that. But they have very precise, often quite short, sometimes we fantasise they've got very long histories, but that's because we're using contemporary categories and concepts and universalising them. Um, this is what Louis, the Marxist Louis Althusser called the very definition of ideology. It's a bad eternality. It's like things that I think now have always been that way. There's always been art. There's always been psychology. They haven't. They haven't been these things. So, so Heidegger's on to something. Like really, something really important thinking about what is cultural difference uh, and, you know, what does it mean for a Westerner to look at Japanese or Chinese or Korean or you name the country, culture, what happens in that process? We could flip it back into Orientalist terms, into Edward Said's terms and go, well you Orientalise it don't you? And you go, it's very different, it's not as good as Shakespeare, but it's very different and, and we like it and we can fetishise it and so on. So this is, the, I've written what happens in translation, this is the, this is the question here, what happens in cultural trans, or in any, tra in linguistic translation, conceptual translation, cultural translation. Um, and I've put a little, a little um, Walter Benjamin meme. Walter Benjamin um, wrote a very, he wrote two very famous essays. One was called The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction. But that, that's an English translation of the title. Some people go, ah, oh, he meant reproducibility, actually, in the German, the original. And he wrote a, one called The Task of the Translator. Both of which are really interesting essays. Um, and if there's time, we shall see. I might say a bit more about both of those essays. But they're both, like, monumentally important essays for any kind of cultural studies. Um... There was an item about Walter Benjamin on Radio 4 this week, what day is it? No, it might have been Flash Friday, Radio 4, 9 o'clock in the morning. I, I couldn't listen to it because I had work to do. Um, probably writing this lecture and finding this thing. But anyway, so what happens in translation? This is um, Japanese again. The language of the dialogue was European. But what was to be experienced and to be thought was the East Asian nature of Japanese art. Whatever we spoke about was from the start forced over into the sphere of European ideas. Um, this is something that... There's loads of ways you could conceptualise this. You know, there are, there are you know, like, relatively new legal concepts in, in British law, ideas of like coercive control, where someone has done something, like being victim of an abusive relationship. You can't put into words how you find yourself in certain relationships doing certain things. And you could technically be culpable of something, like, you know, you went along with something, or you agreed to something, or you were abused. But you're being controlled in ways that are non-literal and non-definite and imprecise. So examples like that, it's not just uh, like how do you articulate being forced into a different world, a world, different sorts of ideas. It's not really just one culture to another. You could think about this in lots of ways. Ways to articulate the specificity of a cultural context. Whatever we spoke about was from the start forced over into the sphere of European ideas. What made you aware of that? The manner in which Kuki explained the basic word iki. So, I'll say a tiny bit about cultural translation. What Walter Benjamin um, argued about translation is that, um, you know, you remember your basic sort of semiotics and your Ferdinand de Saussure, and you've got your signifier, which is the squiggle on the page, the scribble or the noise random noise that is an arbitrary part of a language, could be something else, to squiggle, to dot, to dash. And then the signified d, which is the thing, right? You know that, you remember that stuff. I say tree, 
you go, oh, mental concept of tree, and it refers to an actually existing thing in the world. You know, you could we say in a different language, we say arbre. You go, okay, I can speak French. You say arbre to someone who doesn't speak French, it's just a noise, right? Um, well, and, and all the languages. But we've all got a word for tree. Well, we haven't. Some, some languages don't have tree. They don't distinguish between tree and bush, for example, like we do that in English. We cut up the universe like that. Other languages don't. But we have the word tree. France agrees. <laughs> oh, probably we agree with France. Arbor, okay, we'll call it tree. Um, because we come from the sort of Nordic languages. Anyway, this is not about language. This is about the arbitrariness of signifying. Walter Benjamin argued that we tend to chase the signified. But if it's a work of literature, a work of art, there's more things going on. What about the signifiers? What about the sound of it? The feel of it? The kind of... The, the beauty of it. So you can have like a direct, literal translation of what you believe an East Asian text means. And you lose everything about it that was poetic or that was... You know, you, so you, you should also, for Walter Benjamin, you've also got to chase the signifier, the sonorousness, the kind of luxuriousness, the, the, the tone of it and the, the way in which it has a kind of poetry. And also, you can never be sure what the signified is anyway. So this is back to basic deconstruction. Like, if I write something down on a postcard and, and you all read the postcard, you don't necessarily know who I'm writing it to, what, whether it's in code, whether I'm telling the truth. So you construct a meaning. I think the author of this meant blah, blah, blah. Imagine the problems when you go back thousands of years and you find ancient Indian or Chinese or Japanese texts or European, whatever, and you go, right, okay, hieroglyphs scribbled onto walls in, in, in Egypt or wherever. What does that mean? And you look for the signified, but to know what the signified, what the intended meaning is, you need to know everything about the author, the context, the, the, the ritual or cultural or artistic status of that. So you shouldn't just chase the signified, the meaning, because that's maybe always a little bit lost to us anyway. But you need to know a shitload. You can explain Iki to me, like Wikipedia did, and I go, okay, I'm happy with that. Mm. But have I got it? Probably not. But possibly, I don't know. We're never going to be quite sure of that. Anyway, the... Um, the really sort of <coughs> cultural argument is that Heidegger argues that the whole world is being Europeanized, or what we might now just call Americanized. So, I'll read this bit out. The temptation is great to rely on European ways of representation and their concepts. That temptation is reinforced by a process which I would call the complete Europeanization of the earth and of man. So it's not just stuff that goes around the world, not just mining and ports and cities and telecommunications and all the rest of it. It's that the effect that that has on man, humans, people. Um, it changes us, is the argument kind of like an Adorno and Horkheimer type of argument here, like we're surrounded by junk, we become junk. We are the junk that wants the junk. Yeah? Eat more McDonald's, man. I've eaten loads of McDonald's and drank loads of Coke and yet I'm still thirsty and hungry and I'm fat. And I feel miserable. I better have some more McDonald's and some more pop. Right? And I've got no energy anymore. I disagree with McDonald's in principle, um, but I do still have McDonald's if I'm a bit hungover or have been on a long journey. So, so Europeanization of the earth and of man and of humanity. Many people consider this process the triumphal march of reason. At the end of the 18th century, in the French Revolution, was not reason proclaimed a goddess. Indeed, the idolization of that divinity is in fact carried so far that any thinking which rejects the claim of reason as not originary simply has to be maligned today as unreason. So, 
This is an interesting reading of the history of re, capital R, reason, which was, as Heidegger is suggesting here, like the highest value of the kind of Western Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, it's like philosophic, let's be reason, let's be scientific, right? So then you start to get the binaries, which we've already seen with, with um, Orientalism, where reason becomes like the man, the European man who goes to university and he learns his stuff and he learns his skill and his trade and it's reasonable and it's logical and it's, you start to get, um, you know, philosophical definitions of, of, you know, homo economicus, like rational man pursues rational things for self-gain. You get all this kind of capitalist theory, liberal theory. And anything that isn't that is unreason, feminized. There's lots of ways that these binaries, you know, the binaries that Saeed points out, they've got a complex history that maybe converge on it in lots of different ways. So this is another sort of binary, reason, unreason. Europe as reason, non-Europe as unreason. The incontestable dominance of your European reason is thought to be confirmed by the success of that rationality which technical advances set before us at every turn. This delusion is growing so that we are no longer able to see how the Europeanization of man and earth attacks at the source everything that is of an essential nature. It seems that these sources are to dry up. So, Heidegger is a, in like, he's defending difference. He's defending the idea that there's so much stuff that exceeds a narrow conception of reason. So he's, it's like he's viewing, it's almost like he's viewing, if you think about this sort of image, like Europe, in this way, Europeanization is this march of stuff. It's like I always have this sort of image of lava coming down from a volcano and just destroying the shit out of everything that it passes. Some of it gets preserved and then you have a museum and it's Pompeii and you go on holiday, and, blah, blah, blah. and but, but the point is, it's this kind of destruction of, uh, that, that creates something new in itself. Other original stuff might, main might remain, but it's, it's for a museum. It's, it's for the, the cash nexus. It's, it's a little bit of garnish on the side of the dish, that little bit of difference. That's the image that I have. There might be other ones. Or the image of a tide, you know, like you, you've made sandcastles, and the tide's out. And then the end of the, the sea comes in, and woof, they're all gone. And like Europe is like that sea, like that tide. This is the kind of um, image that 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 we're dealing with. What Europeanization is, kind of a destruction that also preserves. And then there's this really, um, this is interesting. So I know that a lot of you in here are interested in things like film. They start talking about Rashomon. Now you don't really think of Heidegger. Well, I don't, because I've got lots of stereotypes about Heidegger in my head, uh, and lots of little anecdotes that help me to create this caricature picture of Heidegger. It's almost like you picture him sitting in his like National Socialist uniform, and he had a little hut, but apparently he had a, also a telly. He got a black and white telly when they became available, so that he could watch the football. So it's like all these really weird, like, but he would he would deny that he'd hide the telly because that's not like traditional. Right? So you have this ambivalent kind of Adorno and Horkheimer-like state. It's like, he wants to watch the telly, and then goes, oh, that's all trash. It's all rubbish. I hate that Americanization. Right? They talk about Rashomon, which is a fantastic film. Have you seen it? Rashomon? Really just watch it. It's so good. So good. And it was made in 1950. Well, it was probably made in 1949. Released in 1950. Fabulous film. So, the first time I read this, I was like, shit, film studies, Heidegger film studies, okay. <coughs> a striking example for what you have in mind is the internationally known film Rashomon. Perhaps you've seen it, so it's a Japanese film. And it's about an event, and it's about reconstructing an event, and you've got different people's... It's like a really early example of, of people saying, well, this happened, and then this happened, and someone else going, but are you sure that's what happened? And then you get someone else's version of the event. Loads of different versions of the same event. And it's, it's just really kind of hip, hypnotic to watch. It's so brilliantly done. Um, 
And Akira Kurosawa, as a, you know, they say, oh, Akira Kurosawa was the first time that you saw this Japanese filmmaking voice present on the international landscape. Kurosawa was really influenced by Western films, inevitably, because that was the first real, like, globally dominant film industry. So therefore people go, oh, but are Kurosawa films really Japanese films? He was so westernised already, and it's the very fact that he, he was making films. So Rashomon, perhaps you've seen it. Fortunately, yes. Unfortunately, only once. I believe that I was experiencing the enchantment of the Japanese world. The enchantment that carries us away into the mysterious. So Heidegger writes a lot of sentences like this. Really strange. You go, what? Anyway. And so I do not understand why you offer just this film as an example of an all-consuming Europeanization. We Japanese consider the presentation frequently too realistic. For example, in the duelling scene. It's got some good duelling scenes in it. But are there not also subdued gestures, says Heidegger? <clears throat> Inconspicuities of this kind flow abundantly and hardly noticeable to a European observer. I recall a hand resting on another person in which there is concentrated a contact that remains infinitely remote from any touch, something that may not even be called gesture any longer in the sense in which I understand your usage. For this hand is suffused and borne by a call, calling from afar, and calling still farther onwards, because stillness has brought it. Sentence. Awful. But, uh, but like, he's trying, he's trying. Okay. But in view of such gestures, which differ from our gestures, I fail even more to understand how you can mention this film as an example of Europeanization. Um, uh, okay. Boom. I'll cut to the chase. The chase is this. The I think I might have some quotes from. I'm not going to play the, the thing. There might be some quotations on the next slide, but that's this is just a trailer of Rashomon. Um, might be in this section here. Yes, it is in this section here. I'll read this section, then I'll explain. Ultimately, I did mean something else altogether with my reference to realism in the film. <coughs> this, that the Japanese world is captured and imprisoned at all in the objectness of photography and is in fact especially framed for photography. Here's the argument. Photography, the camera, the screen, can only capture, capture so much. We've kind of talked a little bit about this already. The, the feeling, the structures, the, there's so much more that maybe can't be expressed in the film camera and the projection onto the screen. And so the very globalization of that technology is moving everything into what is here being presented as westernized, Americanized, Europeanized. Make of that what you will. So we could translate it into slightly simpler terms. Akira Kurosawa loved American films of cowboy films, loved all the rest of them, and then went on to become a filmmaker inspired by Western films. So then you can go, that's already Westernized, you're using a Western genre, Western styles, Western acting, Western blah, 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 blah. Might be in Japan, might be in Japanese, but it's Westernized, inherently. That's the argument. And then there's this contrast that they set up between the Japanese no play and film. Film is presented as European or American. The Japanese no play is presented as kind of quintessentially Japanese. So I'll read on a little bit more. So, objectness of photography. Um, are all films presented like this, or are you just using... You just just using this as a stark Heidegger-type example, okay. and it's something to maybe get your teeth into and think about the ramifications of that. Yeah. I don't... <laughs> I wouldn't throw this one out. There's something in here. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know what I mean? There's something important here. But I mean, there have been very long Asian film traditions. You know, just as long. Um, you know, like 1920s Chinese martial arts films. You know, um, like lots of really. Do you think it's unfair to call film a uh, Western concept? Yes, but. There's something in this argument 
which is the it might it, it might boil down to the word capture. So this is an argument about moving from depth to surface. So Heidegger is talking about cultural depth. And the argument is that you can't capture the experience of, of, an, of, a, of a play. So the Japanese no plays, this is like the, the oldest continuous theatrical tradition existing in the world, is, is what the internet tells me, right? And you couldn't just point a camera at that and get it. This is the, the ultimate argument is this. If we take the Japanese no play as the quintessence of something Japanese, so like I already know that if I went to Japan and someone made me sit through one of these things, I would probably hate every minute of it and be bored out of my skull because I didn't understand it, right? If for, only for that reason. And there'll be any number of examples that you could go to a different culture and they say, this is the best thing ever. Enjoy this and you're like, I, I don't get it. Because I'm so thoroughly Western, I could sit and watch a, a Japanese film with subtitles and, and maybe find a better chance. But the argument is, modern Western technology, camera, frame, image, sound, maybe subtitles, that becomes the dominant cultural mode in which all of this stuff is lost. So then, I guess the scenario would be, if, you know, think about Heidegger as a bit like Theodore Adorno or Max Horkheimer, if you read any of that ever at all. You get, the worst case scenario is you get a generation of Japanese people growing up, not getting the Japanese no play, and just kind of going, I'd, I'd rather watch a cowboy film. Or I want to watch Rashomon. So this is what Heidegger's worried about, the, the swamping of a cultural context of difference with the sameness of a globalised technology which he is calling westernised, which we don't have to, but that's where he's saying the march is coming from. And lots of cultures have had this historically through the 20th century. Americanization of Britain, Americanization of other European countries. Um, yep? Um, I just have a question, like, you were saying that, like, it could be that a generation of Japanese children might, might not get it, but is it not, like, solely dependent on who the spectator watching is and, like, Kind of like the cultural background that the spectator comes from. Yeah, so what he's concerned about is the destruction of cultural backgrounds or their subtle transformation into a culture of surfaces, which he's calling. So Heidegger is ideologically aligned with that kind of any... And a way of thinking that the Nazis really liked, but also lots of different ideologies like, which is that of the folk. The folk are connected to the earth, right? Folk is the German word for the people. It's where the people of the earth, not the people of the of the image. That's that's. So there's a real what you, what we would call, and this will be relevant soon, a metaphysical distinction between reality, the truth, the best. So that's the blood and the soil. And you get a lot of nationalisms like this, which shade into racisms. The blood and the soil, because blood is is a, is code for skin color, right? Um, or surname, I don't know. Um, blood and soil, so Heidegger was very much a blood and soil, certainly a soil kind of person, the folk of the earth, blah, blah, blah. and like, you know, the, the Russian Stalin used this, and, 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 and Mao used this, Hitler used this, and lots of people use this. People, the, the salt of the earth, right? So, Heidegger is worried about the destruction of all of this by what he is calling westernization. Um, so, we're nearly, we're almost finished with Heidegger. This might be, this is the end of Heidegger, so we can have a quick break, because we've done a lot of Heidegger. Or we can do questions, if you don't need a break. Um, that's another way of thinking about it. Cultural imperialism, but it's, but it's, but it's the cultural imperialism shifting it into the frame of a camera of a technology that becomes dominant, that squashes out this. So this is all going to remain. Look, someone's pointed a camera at this to take a picture of it. But we're not in a Japanese no play. We're not in the audience of a Japanese no play here, right? We're not. It's on the screen which transforms it into a different realm, which Heidegger's worried about. Because he thinks we're losing something. Well, the East Asian world is losing its cultural difference, its cultural depth. 
right? The metaphor of depth, the metaphor of surface, these... And, and we can deconstruct them because it's just a metaphor, it's a word, depth. When you talk about like a deeper meaning or a deep... If that's a metaphor, we could have different metaphors to organise our, our thinking, but it's, it's a tenacious metaphor, it's a one that... There's also something in it, do you know what I mean? There definitely is, but mm, how do we deal with that something that's in it? Um, so, object, objectness of philosophy. Um, if I have listened rightly, you would say that the East Asian world and the technical aesthetic product of the film industry are incompatible. Um, this is what I have in mind. Regardless of what the aesthetic quality of a Japanese film may turn out to be, the mere fact that our world is set forth in the frame of a film forces that world into the sphere of what you call objectness. The photographic objectification is already a consequence of the ever wider outreach of Europeanization. A European will find it difficult to understand what you mean? Certainly. And especially because the foreground world of Japan is altogether European, or if you will, American. The background world of Japan, on the other hand, or better, that world itself, is what you experience in the no play. I don't know a book about it, so I had a guess, I don't know anything about the no play, I've never seen one. I've read a book about it once. So we're dealing with these binaries, East and West. Um, I guess surface and depth. Which, which also maps onto technologization, which is westernization here. And then the effects of that, which you called cultural imperialism, which is fair enough, it's another term. A lot of these terms can be translated into each other, and that's what interpretation is, isn't it? It's kind of translating something into another thing. But, which is how we make sense of anything. You tell me a word or concept that I don't know, and I'll translate it, and I'll link it to something that I do, and go, okay, that's how I understand it. So, that's how I'll grab hold of it and go, I get it. But the risk is that I translate, if you tell me what iki is, I go, okay, I get iki. Or certain borrow words like chic, for example, from French, like chic, we could say that in English. It's not an English word, but it almost is now. But I translate it into something that I already know. Me, that's a mistranslation. So translation's really tricky, um, and there's a lot. Of, there's a lot of questions. Like I experience, I go and I experience an authentic thing that's centuries old, and I make sense of it this way. And you could go, no, 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 because your cultural sort of habitus or cultural context, it's not it's something else. So it's got, we've got a lot of complicated issues here. Um, and Stella Sanford goes at them, big style. So do we need, what time is it, quarter past? Five minutes, or should we just plow on? Have a vote. Vote for five minutes break. All right, let's do that.